I'm Nick Morrison, I'm from Bloomington, Indiana, and I was a sergeant in the United States Marine Corps. There's a place up on the mountain. We're going I to like Nanny's. To go there when I'm low. And now he's gonna go work to work. Take a look across the valley. We're only yeah, about a quarter it. mile from Lake Monroe. <laughs> it's kind of behind us and to our left. Today is a good day. I grew up downtown, literally on Fifth Street, or what they call it Kirkwood now. And then, in the middle school or high school, we moved out to the north side of town. He was a good kid. He was energetic. He was funny. He had always had lots of friends. He is six years older than our youngest, and he helped a lot with his sister and was always jumping in and helping in anything from his 4-H group to working with the swim team and, and volunteering for a lot of different projects. A better question is what didn't I do probably growing up? Um, I was involved in Science Olympiad, which is just like an academic contest over all sorts of various scientific disciplines, all sorts of stuff. I was really into that. I did 4-H for 10 years. We, we raised sheep. Yeah, at one point, we probably had a little over 20, 25 head of sheep. We raised goats. My sister had a horse. I played football a little bit, middle school, early high school, and then I stopped and started swimming. I swam competitively my sophomore, junior, and senior year. And I was involved in uh, junior leaders a leadership group for, for young people, focusing around community involvement, fundraising. The, the middle layers were like a blue-green color. Yeah. Nice. Me and Nick met as freshmen in high school. I'd gone to a different middle school. I didn't really know too many people. Whenever I went in as a freshman, and of the eight classes uh, I had as a freshman, Nick was in five of them. So yeah, we. Uh, became pretty fast friends and then then I was on the soccer team he was friends with a lot of the guys on the team so we also started hanging out and um, just became great friends <laughs> Nick's someone that um, in a social setting he's not someone that is going to dominate a party or anything like that but it's something where it's very quiet strength where you know if you do need something from him all you have to do is pick up the phone and, and call. K-L-M-N-O-P-Q-R-S-T-U-V-W-X. I was going to college because that's what I was told I was supposed to do. In all honesty, at 18, 19, 20, I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. I never had any idea of, there was never anything that called to me. It was like, like I have to do that. Like, um, so I, I honestly felt kind of lost in college. I'm Mama. Yeah. Hey, Mama. Maddie Mae. Maddie Mae, Maddie Mae. Mom, let's go in. Let's grab the things. I need to read a carry boat. Okay. A lot of family members that were in the military. My dad's father served in World War II. My dad's uncle died in the Battle of the Bulge. My great uncle, my mom's uncle by marriage, uh, he fought in the Korean War, was actually wounded very badly in the Korean War. My mom's dad served in the Army National Guard. So I mean, a lot of family history. Uh, even in, back into the Spanish-American War, we have, a, I have an old roster with one of the, Ham was their last name. He was the uh, general quartermaster for his unit. So the military was, honestly, it was, you know, I wasn't, college wasn't, I wasn't thriving in college. I felt lost, felt like I wasn't doing much. There was just a kind of a sense of 
duty, the, something that I wanted to do. And just being part of something bigger than yourself. Yeah. I met Nick in college. What attracted me to Nick was the fact that he had such a good heart and was a little shy. And something that we always joke about is he has these really good snaps. And so when he would be dancing, he'd like have these really good snaps. And so we still talk about it to this day. He had me at his snaps. Yep. So I did not know him when he enlisted, but I, we started dating before he left for Iraq. We were serious. Um, it got serious pretty fast. And um, I mean, it was exclusive. I wasn't dating anybody else and told him I'd be here when he got back. We are lovers, we are fighters, flying higher, and we never give in. We are fighters, flying higher, and we never give in. And if we start to fall from grace, oh if we start to fall from grace, we won't ever lose our faith. I've known Nick for over 30 years now. We grew up in the same neighborhood. Um, I was homeschooled though, so I didn't go to school with him, but lived right across the street from one of our mutual good, good friends, who we're still good friends with. I wouldn't call it surprising that he went into the military. His dad and him always used to play those little war games with, I don't even know what they call them. I think that was one of the only times I heard my mom curse. This is when I told her I joined the Marine Corps. <laughs> I think it was something along the lines of like, why the f*** you do that or something like that. <laughs> when he called and told me the first time, I lost Mother of the Year Award right then. I mean, it was, it was not good. Then Nick and Dave went on a bike ride. It must have been six hours. And then Nick explained to his father why he wanted to join the Marines. And after Dave came back with him, he said, you know, I can't fault anything that he said that he felt like that this was something that he needed to do. And of course, then we were always, always supportive. I was probably not a great friend during that time period, to be totally honest. What I mean by that is my awareness, given the fact that I was in school, I didn't have the awareness of the war efforts at that time, maybe like we would today, and all the hazards that comes with that not just while overseas at war, but then when they come home. Joining the military gave me a, a, a sense of purpose that was greater than myself. Um, it, it allowed me to the opportunity to, to serve other people. I mean, I've always been a helper. Um, that's the way I've always, I've just built that way. Before he left, um, we did talk about like kind of what we wanted our life to look like, but it, there was nothing about marriage at that point. I was still in school, and so even though it was fresh, like it was, it, it was very difficult. It was really scary. It was very, very scary. We were in Napa Valley, and we had gone out with uh, David's nephew and my niece, and. We were at a winery and... Which you'd think would be a good place to be if you were gonna get the call that he's gonna leave. And I do think it was the hardest day of my life. Or one of them that would come. Um, it was, on the phone, you have to be like, you know, like all cheery and like, oh, you know, we'll be praying for you. And that I will still see it was, it was difficult. For I will keep you in my heart.
I deployed in 2005 to Iraq. My primary MOS was telephone systems and intermediate personal computer repair. Uh, so anything ground related in electronics, I fixed it. I actually was deployed as a civil affairs non-commissioned officer. So that was a completely different MOS. So we actually had to go to a school and then uh, was in Fallujah, Iraq from 2005 to 2006. We've fallen under Special Operations Command and our mission um, was to assess and help rebuild local Iraqi infrastructure. Um, medical facilities, bridges, water treatment facilities, irrigation pumps, schools. Um, that's what we did. So I went into it wanting to help, wanting to help the, the Iraqi people. We, we don't get to choose where we, where we start our lives. You know, it's, it's a luck of a draw where you're born. So if I could help these people, um, that, that's what I wanted to do. He had access to a satellite phone. So we were very fortunate that every Sunday night we got a phone call. Basically what we talked about was things he needed. I'd ask him the mom things like, you know, are you able to eat? Um, another time he shared with me that one of the schools that they were working with needed supplies. So our good friends at South High School orchestrated a fund to send paper and pencils. You go into country with hearts and minds. That's what we did. Um, we were not door kickers. We were not there to necessarily kill the enemy. It was our job to help get them something to build upon once we left. So I went into it wanting to help. By the time we went to Iraq, kinetic operations they weren't as prevalent. I mean, we had pretty much pounded them um, into submission. Um, so they went to guerrilla tactics and it was IEDs. I mean, I was there in the IED. It was a heyday. There were IEDs everywhere. So I never saw an enemy. I mean, my enemy was everywhere. It wouldn't matter if you were walking down a market. Someone would spray with machine gun fire down a, indiscriminately down a market. You know, it could hit civilians, it hit your, your buddies. I mean, there was no, there was no enemy, and that was really hard. I remember being on campus doing my homework and seeing on TV and passing down the halls footage of what was going on and knowing proximity where he was at, and I would just start breaking down, and it was really, it was really difficult. I was green, naive. I was going to change the world. I was going to, you know. <laughs> yeah, I was so naive. Um, I, I was naive in thinking that I could do great things and help people. And we did. We made tangible differences. I mean, we re rebuilt several schools. We re rebuilt bridges. We re rebuilt water treatment facilities. So, I mean, we had tangible gains that, you know, I could wrap my mind around. But some people in the population didn't care for us, didn't want our help, didn't need our help, could care less. It's very stressful. Through the rubble, rock and roll, my team's in a huddle. It's about elevation, dedication. We will fight for the right situation if you're ready for the long haul. It's roll call, tie your bootstraps up, homie. We go hard. So I was personally hit by two IEDs. Um, uh, we, as a team, as a whole, we were hit six times. Um, we found another 10. <clears throat> a lot of hate and anger crept in, and you start to view them differently. Um, I was just trying to survive. He would call every Sunday. He had a satellite phone, so that's one thing that kept me going was at least I can talk to him at least once a week, but then the call stopped. I, I don't know if he's gonna come home, if that's one of the, the people on the, the news that they're talking about that was just in the you know, roadside bomb or, or um, a suicide bomber. And they were showing you know, the footage, but is that Nick? I know he's around there. He, he tells me he's outside the wire a lot. So it's, I just had no clue. And it was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying. Once you reach a certain point, 
all of that stress goes away because it, at one point, and I remember, I can draw you a picture of where I was when I had this realization, I had to tell myself that, <clears throat> that I was dead. I had to accept that I was dead because that was the only way I could keep going. Once I accepted that I was dead man walking, it's a really weird, freeing, liberating. It's hard to explain, but it's freeing in some capacity because you're literally living in the moment to the nth degree um, and you have to, to stay alive. One Sunday, he didn't call. And it was, we kept waiting and waiting and waiting and never heard anything. So by the next morning, we hadn't heard from him. I'd say we were both pretty, pretty upset because I was getting ready to go to work. And I saw on the news where Marines were killed. And knowing that that was a Sunday, we'd not heard from him. So we waited for the phone to ring and it didn't ring on Monday either. I thought that when he left for Iraq, that was the worst moment of my life. But I would say that Monday evening was probably the worst time. So Tuesday I go to work and I don't hear anything. So I believe it was on Wednesday. And I can remember like it was yesterday, I was in a patient's room and I heard my phone ring. And I remember answering the phone, it was Ned. I thought I was the happiest when he was born. I think that was probably the happiest time. I think I was the happiest times of my life. For me, I still miss it. Iraq was my best and worst memories. It's this weird duality. You know, I miss my team. You know, you, you build a bond that you just won't build anywhere else. It's the ultimate act of service, in my opinion. I was willing, and anyone anyone to my left or right that I served with was willing to give our lives for each other and for our country. So there's no questions asked there. I've got one foot in the grave. I've got but after you get blown up so many times, <laughs> after you see people die, after you experience what I experienced, you start to change. Um, I, I was not the same person I was at the end of my deployment that I was at the beginning. Oh, Jesus, can you hear my plea? God brought me here, now he wants me to leave. Jesus, lay your forgiving hands on me. The day he came home, we were at the armory in Indianapolis and we had welcome home signs and I just ran up and gave him a hug. He had a rose for me. He sent me roses, like a countdown. So like 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, you know, and the final one was um, like this golden dipped rose. Like, who does that? I had a four day transition period. Four days from in Iraq to Indianapolis, Indiana. The very last mission we went on, we were doing right seat, left seat. I mean, new guys are coming in, you know, they followed us for a week, and then we moved back, they moved into the driver's seat, we followed them for a week, kind of just shadowing them. Very last mission, new guys are taking over, we're checked out, short timers, not thinking anything. Me and Sergeant Roper in a bucket truck, and like I said, very last mission, we, we <laughs> We, we find a, an IED and it literally is from here to this wall from, from us. Anyways, long story short. So I go from that, literally being blown up and four days later, I'm at home with my family. I was glad for when he got back in the States. I think initially he was glad to be home. Um, he was glad to see everyone, but I could see a change in Nick. I felt out of place when I came home, but I didn't really feel I was happy to be home. It's kind of like the honeymoon period, you know. 2008, about a year and a half, two years later, is when I started struggling with 
depression. Um, I turned to alcohol heavily. I just didn't feel right. I didn't feel at home. I didn't feel like I belonged at home. I felt different. <clears throat> I felt alienated. I felt like, <clears throat> like there was something wrong with me. Even though I was on the track and in school to you know become a therapist, I thought he would just come home and still be the regular same old Nick, but just with some experiences that would affect him. But I had no clue that it would be that intent. Um, no clue. Because I, until you live it and see it, and you, it, you can't describe it almost. Why am I not able to do things I used to do? Why can't I go out in public as much as I used to? Why am I always on guard? Why am I jumping out of bed at night? And the list goes on and on. And so I turned to, I self-medicated with alcohol for years. It was very clear because I knew him so well that he was struggling. He wasn't the exact same friend that I had from high school. I mean, none of us were, but it was, it was very apparent that he was having a, just a hard time in general. In 2008 turned into about 2010. My path in 2010 was going to take me to jail or I was going to die. I was going to die by fighting. I was going to die. I was fighting the police. I was fighting my friends. I was fighting anybody that would fight me. Um, so I was either going to go to jail. I was either going to drink myself to death or I was just going to die in a fight. That's where my, that was my path. I was working as a therapist my first year. I was running the intensive outpatient program for substance abuse and I got home because it was an evening group. I got home and he wasn't around. There were bottles everywhere. Um, the cabinets in the kitchen, everything was punched in. Long story short, he was at somebody's house. I didn't know, so I went to go get him. He was out of his mind. Like, it was it was not him. And he wasn't making sense. He got in the car, we were driving home. He was threatening to jump out of the car. He gets back home um, and not making any sense. And when he would drink, he it's, does the opposite. It's not a downer for him. It's an, it, He like gets enraged. He was, got up on his work van, was like jumping up and down, like again, in and out of the house. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. At that point, I didn't know what to expect. So there was a lot of concern. We get a call from Mia about, uh, about nine o'clock, nine o'clock at night, and she said, can you come over? She says, I can't get through to Nick. And I knew Mia, and Mia's a strong woman, and I knew if she was calling that it was something that really she couldn't handle. And so Dave and I drove in there, and Nick was, um, he was not Nick. He was, um... <clears throat> I was doing everything I could, I think, to try to just end it. Just try and stop the pain, stop the... <clears throat> the intrusive thoughts, the feeling of feeling different, and the feeling of, you know, why can't I interact with friends and family like I used to? You know, why can't I do things that I used to? He had just a confluence of events between family stuff and a few other just personal things just really hit all at once. And he had a really bad night and I heard from Mia. And that's when it, everything kind of hit home for me and where I really got worried about my best friend and losing him. Do you hear the statistic about losing 22 service people a day? Um, I never thought that'd be my buddy until recently. <clears throat> and I got scared to death. He was trying to process, I think, everything that he um, had witnessed and been involved with in verbatim, you know, you don't understand, you know, you're a dead man walking. <clears throat> when you see 
four of your Marine blown into pieces, little pieces. And you don't even know what parts of the bodies go to what body and you just have a pile. And you don't even know if the right parts are going to go home to their right families. <clears throat> when you see that and you live it and you deal with it, <clears throat> it's, it's hard for it not to take hold. <clears throat> and you build this syntax and you build this program in your brain so you keep that, that, that one foot in front of the other. Because if you don't, you'll drive yourself crazy. And that's kind of back to the, the dead man walking component that I talk about. I believe the hypervigilance of what he experienced was um, some of the catalyst for his anxiety. And we couldn't get through to him. It's really hard when parents can't, can't. When you can't fix or help your children, it's very difficult. When I was at my darkest, um, I call it going dark. I, 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 don't, I don't even think I was self-aware enough to even know that I had an issue. I just knew that I had dealt with some really bad things. I had seen some really bad stuff. And I was, you know, I was alive. <laughs> I came home. A lot of other guys didn't. So it was a really hard, hard for me to even tell myself that I had issues and that I needed help because I was here. And, that, and, and to me, that was, I, that should have been enough for me. And, uh, but ultimately, you know, it wasn't. Number one, I think his survivor's remorse was more than anything that I could ever, I, I just, I couldn't fix it. It was way, it was out, out of my hands. You know, I, I stopped drinking in, in 2010, so that was a good thing. So I stopped with the self-medicating, the alcohol, and then I buried myself in work. And so for about seven and a half years, I managed a bar and restaurant and I own my own business. I did electronic security. <laughs> I'd do my business during the week and then I'd work 35 hours at the bar on the weekend. And looking back on it now, it was totally a, a way of avoidance to not, to just stay busy. If I kept moving and I kept active and I kept doing stuff, I didn't have to think about it. And I could feel normal again. And that was about my worst I, I was since my deployment 14 years later. I wasn't eating. My bowels had stopped working. I was about 148 pounds, so about 30 pounds lighter than I am now. I wasn't sleeping. I'd wake up 10 to 20 times a night. <clears throat> I would wake up in the middle of the night out of a sleep to a security light on my exterior detached garage that's 200 feet from my house that happens to shine in through my master bedroom window with the blinds closed. That little amount of light would wake me up. And I mean, out of, I mean, jumping out of bed up. It wasn't him, like the, the the old Nick versus the new Nick. It was just like, it was like the shell. I mean, it's just not him. Like I knew the old him is there somewhere. Like there were moments, of course, where, you know, the old Nick would come out, show his heart. And so it was almost just like a closed off Nick um, who had an exterior that was very, very toxic and broken. And he was just trying to keep it all together. I had a conversation with myself, and the conversation went, what's wrong with me? Come and shine in the darkest corners of my mind. I've been chasing shadows way too long. And I started looking through the hierarchy of needs, going through them in my mind, like, I have an awesome house. I have an awesome wife. I have two beautiful daughters. I luckily have most of my physical capabilities. <laughs> What's wrong with me? I didn't know. I didn't know anymore. I didn't, I didn't know how to help myself. I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know what to do. 
Yeah, I was, I, I was, I was in a really dark place. I've been chasing shadows way too long. There was no enemy, and that was really hard. And I think I brought that home with me because I think I was still looking for an enemy and I never found it. I needed to, I needed to process. I needed to, I needed to go through the things that I saw and talk about the things that I saw to heal because keeping it buried inside of me was going to kill me. I mean, I've been in therapy on and off since 2010. Um, I did about a year and a half of prolonged exposure therapy through the VA. And then I saw various other therapists. So, I mean, I've worked with probably four or five different therapists over the years, and I've, I've been putting work in for years, and, you know, I wasn't getting any better. My wife's a mental health therapist, and she's the only reason I'm here, able to talk to you guys today. And I don't think if I had her in my life, I'd be here, in all honesty. I was a team lead um, in my job, so I had a caseload and I worked with a team of therapists who I supervised and I was asked by our director of military services if I'd be interested in connecting with Wounded Warrior Project about possibility of doing these retreats. I was like, yeah, like, of course. And so I think I've done 13 maybe odysseys. Project Odyssey was developed as a way to bring warriors together, to bring back that sense of camaraderie, that sense of connection, um, while also learning coping skills to deal with the invisible wounds of war, such as post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety. So we bring um, veterans out with us into various locations across the country and engage in team building activities, problem solving. Um, there's a great deal of psychoeducation, all with the purpose of increasing um, overall psychological well-being and their sense of resilience. I was doing a male odyssey and I would always FaceTime Nick at night and so one time after our, de our debrief, I was like, let's call him right now. And he does not like stuff like that, like to be put on the spot. So we FaceTimed him and I was like, Nick, like, like how is two weeks from now? Like, you want to go? And he was like, long story short, he ended up going, which was, he, 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 he didn't used to say yes to things like this. Um, so I was stoked, like, I was so excited, I couldn't even take it. And so that's how he got involved. And, and since then, Wounded Warrior Project has been critical in his recovery. Parading of the boats. It's like Fleet Week almost. <laughs> <laughs> she was really the catalyst to say, go. This would be good for you. <clears throat> I went on my first Project Odyssey, and it was it was a great experience. But I wasn't ready at that time on my first Odyssey. Um, it was a great recharge for myself. It was awesome to get to be with the other veterans. There's gonna come a time when life will treat you so rough. There's gonna come a time giving more than you get. Project Odyssey is not a magic wand. It's not really a, a, a quick fix for anything. We try to set expectations early on of this is really a step forward, um, but it's kind of the first step and hopefully um, what is going to be a really cool journey forward. Um, but it's not always a one-stop shop, so we invite warriors to come back on a Project Odyssey, and that's what Nick did. Um, and I think that's when he was really to start accepting uh, what the next steps were that he needed to do for himself and for his family. Gonna come a time, don't you worry, child. It's gonna come a time, and I'm there by your side. Really, the magic happened for me on my second Odyssey. We had just finished the first day, and it was sprinkling out. And I didn't care. I went out and I built a campfire. And it was me and, and maybe four other warriors were around the campfire and we were just hanging out and talking. And slowly as the night progressed, they trickled off and went to their, to their rooms. Finally, it was just me and it was about 1 a.m. And I finally was like, all right, I guess I can go to bed. And I, I get in bed and I start to go to sleep. And I have the worst flashback I've ever had. It's like being awake but dreaming and I was reliving specifically the one IED, and I just broke down. 
and I cried and it was horrible. It was horrible, convulsive. Uh, I was in a fetal position. I wrapped up a towel and bit into it so I wouldn't make noise so I could cry and get it out without letting any of the other guys know who were sleeping beside me. As I start to finally calm down after what seemed like an eternity, maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes, it was rough. I finally start to collect myself. And at that point I had this thought that I said, I have to tell somebody something. I said, cause I just had this feeling in the pit of my stomach that it, if I didn't, it was going to kill me. It was going to eat me from the inside out. As I start to go back to sleep, I finally calm down. And one of the other warriors calls out in, in a night terror in this like guttural growl. And then I break down again because I know what it is. I know, I know the sound, I know the noise, I know <clears throat> that he's dealing with his own shit. And I just, so I break down again and I start crying again. And then I finally, I'm able to go to sleep. And that next morning is when I went and found the peer mentor. And I said, I got to talk to you. And I just broke down and it was like this expulsatory vomit of, bah, like just, I couldn't get enough out fast enough of just, just stuff that I had buried for so long. That odyssey, that night, that, that was my aha moment, or I, it was the catalyst to start me on actually wanting to to attempt to face it head on. He came back from that initial odyssey and he was like, I, I realized I, I can't bury it anymore. I have to do something about this. He was just overwhelmed with all the years of experiences, but also pent up emotions and reactions and thoughts and feelings from not ever processing through it, that it seemed like trying to drink from a fire hydrant from him uh, with everything that was coming back out. Really after that is when I saw the change from, I have to do something about this, to I need help doing something about this. So going on the Project Odyssey, that was the catalyst to get me to be like, man, I gotta, I gotta start working at this. Like, I, it's not gonna change if I don't do anything. Um, and I need to put forth some work into trying to figure out what it, what is causing this and how I can rectify it because otherwise it was going to kill me. After the Odyssey, I reached out to Wounded Warrior Project because I, I, I knew that the IOP was something I needed to do. I needed more help. One of the unique things about the Warrior Care Network is that we really made an intentional effort to increase access to care, quality of care, and frequency of care. And if you've tried to navigate different healthcare systems and run into some barriers, whether that hey, you can only get an appointment every month, whether you you know didn't necessarily like the provider that you saw, the Warrior Care Network has a variety of different options from outpatient treatment to intensive outpatient treatments. And quite often we get folks that have had mental health related care beforehand and we're able to provide a corrective experience for them. One of our four different treatment centers from Rush, Emory, UCLA, or uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, us as a network, really have amazing healthcare. It's comprehensive, it addresses the mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual realms of who you are, and it's what mental health care should look like. It was one of the first times I actually felt that I was in a place that understood me. The chaplain, very first day, he does a class on meaning of service. I had seen numerous therapists at this point, and all of them I had told the same thing. I had told them that one of the things that I was struggling with is that I felt like, and I had used the term my moral compass or my moral barometer had been broken, and that my view on people had changed. They, they became an enemy, they became a threat. Again, going back to kind of never finding an enemy, I extrapolated that and I, I applied that layer to the civilian population in Iraq. And then when I came home, I still was looking for it. And I applied that to the civilian population here. And then it got worse and I, and I still didn't find the enemy and I still couldn't figure out what was going on. So then I applied it to friends, then I'd apply it to family. And then I was just eventually by myself.
and I completely isolated myself. But the chaplain, his like the second sentence out of his mouth, he talked about your moral compass and it being broken or shattered. When he when he shared that with me, I knew I was in the right place. Moral injury is a term we use to describe the longer term psychological, social, spiritual impacts of being in a situation um, where you feel that you have to transgress deeply held moral values. Um, I often think about it as you know being in a situation where you have to act where there is really no good option. Sometimes on, on deployments and in combat, there's some real ethical dilemmas and things can get murky and you may have to act in situations and do things that you might not normally do. But then there's orders to follow and they exist for a reason. There is this acknowledgement of combat deployments contain many ethical dilemmas in many situations where you have to act and there's not a clear right choice. Um, and I don't think that's something that um, a lot of clinicians or mental health providers really had a good appreciation for before moral injury became more part of the conversation. I had this dark cloud, this nebulous cloud of, of stuff from my military, and even not even military, even just life. Everybody has traumas. I mean, we all have our, be it a broken bone, be it a car crash, you know, a parent dying, whatever, everybody has traumas. And I had this nebulous cloud of traumas in my head, and there was so much, and it was so interwoven that I didn't know where to start. And the IOP program gave me that. For me personally, what I've come to realize is that holding on to all that negativity and that dark, the darkness, the anger, the hate, the, the rage, the sadness, the shame, the guilt, hanging on to all of that dark side of the emotion wheel <clears throat> was just going to drag me down. It was going to kill me. I think with some of the issues he was having, the Wounded Warrior Project was, I think he felt like that he finally came to a place where he could be with other veterans who have experienced similar situations and where he could verbalize it and know that someone knows what he's talking about. Being able to feel that I was in a space that was safe to share, being able to be around other peers and other veterans who have experienced similar things and speak the same language, the cynicism and humor that we bring out of things and the sarcasm, it's this awesome thing, this glue that bonds us together. And, and being able to be in that safe space, have the experience that I had, and then being able to feel able to share was awesome for me. I feel he's more comfortable being himself now. He doesn't feel like he has to hide his experiences and his struggles. Uh, certain activity or action might cue a, a memory for him that um, is gonna be totally different than anyone else has um, in that same environment. And he's comfortable now knowing that that's a possibility and that he can handle it and process it in the moment. Whereas before, I think it was that was part of the reason he was so, maybe so distant, reluctant to, to hang out. I had to rely heavily on Wounded Warrior Project, the Odysseys, and the Warrior Care Network. They had to carry me through the early stages of my healing process. I couldn't do it alone. I couldn't do it by myself. I had to accept that and I had to reach out and seek help. Now, it's my turn to give back. It's my turn to be that warrior who's carrying the other warrior, who's facilitating their healing process, gets them out of their head and back into life, get them back into the fight, so to speak. Nick is a really clear example of what it means to live the logo. He's somebody who asked for help to make some changes uh, for himself and for his family. It's a huge sign of strength to say that you need some help. Now he's turned that into giving back to others and giving back to the community that served him. I'm so, so grateful that, that you know, to have Wounded Warrior Project 
give me that opportunity and, and allow me to start trying to heal. Reach out, connect, find somebody that has been through it that uh, can provide support to you even if they don't understand. And, and even if it's the spouse that if you're struggling um, and your partner's not ready to reach out, it's okay for you to still reach out and be that, that first one to take that step. Um, critical. But if you need someone to trust, I'll be your superman. I want to tell veterans who are who are sitting and dealing with with what I dealt with. Don't wait. Don't give up. <clears throat> There's hope. There's there is light at the end of the tunnel. You got to work for it. It's not going to be given to you. <clears throat> it's not going to be easy. <clears throat> you're going to have to you're going to have to work for it. But don't give up. If of any of <clears throat> If there's anyone in this world who deserves to live a happy, long life, it's us. So keep going. <laughs>